then um, let us begin with our lecture today. Here on the blackboard, I summarize the results of our previous calculation. We are at the moment in the middle of calculating an example at the two-loop level and uh, want to evaluate a two-loop Feynman diagram here, the usual self-energy with a one-loop insertion together with the associated counterterm diagrams. And we want to do everything in terms of alpha parameters in the appropriate sectors using the beta and t variables that we introduced according to a labeled forest. This is the method that one can prove in general that uh, in dimensional regularizations, multi-loop integrals plus the associated counterterms are finite and uh, define um, well constructed quantum field theory. So these are the integrals that we obtained by going to the appropriate sectors. For the one loop self energy diagram, we obtain minus i square times an integral over two variables t and beta. Uh, and the integrand contains t to the appropriate power. The power of t is given by power counting minus omega h minus 1 plus 2 epsilon. And omega h is the degree of power counting of that uh, um, Feynman diagram with two propagators. So on the right you see it, it's d0 minus 4. Then we have an exponential function e to the i w h um, uh, coming from the alpha parametrization and a remainder from the determinant or semantic polynomial u, which we now call d tilde h. d tilde h is the part of the semantic polynomial which does not contain the overall t factors anymore. So d h, you see it here, is just 1 plus beta. Uh, depends only on betas and has the structure one plus higher orders in all the variables. And this is the general structure of all these integrals. So the next one is the integral for the counterterm Feynman diagram with an insertion. So uh, forgetting about the insertion for the moment, we have then minus i cubed because of three propagators times the loop factor times an integral over three variables. One variable t for the overall graph, so we call it tg times two betas. Then we have the factor two and the ttg to the appropriate power given by power counting of that counterterm graph minus one plus two epsilon times the exponential function and the d tilde term. And the d tilde term is given over here on the right. It has the same structure as the one for the normal one loop diagram, but beta is replaced by beta 3 plus beta 4 for these two identical lines which appear squared in the Feynman diagram. And here I put in quotation marks the insertion of the counter term because actually the last time we just put it there as a factor, but today we will uh, have to determine what exactly means this insertion and it's uh, more complicated than just a product and we will determine exactly what it really is. But anyway, the insertion is given by minus the divergent part of the one loop diagram. Then finally, the two-loop diagram that we want to renormalize is given by minus i to the fifth two-loop factors and then the integral over all the five variables for the five propagators, two square times the two t variables to the appropriate power counting degrees. And here we have four epsilon because that overall tg corresponds to two loops. Here we have two epsilon because that corresponds to the one-loop subgraph e to the i w g, where w g is given here, more complicated, and d tilde g, where d tilde g is given over there, also more complicated, to the appropriate powers. These are our integrals, and today we want to evaluate all of them to the point where we see whether the whole sum is finite or has some remaining divergencies and where we are able to determine the structure of the remaining divergencies to check whether this is an appropriate way to uh, generate a finite quantum field theory. And uh, today we will learn a lot of lessons which give us indications how one should proceed in general to obtain a general proof of uh, the same statement. Let us begin by going to four dimensions, which is much simpler. In four dimensions, um, let us evaluate the power counting degree. So omega h of the one loop diagram is just zero. So we have a logarithmic divergence. The power counting degree 
of the counterterm Feynman diagram is minus two, so that by itself would be finite, up to, of course, the insertion of the counterterm uh, itself. And omega of the two loop graph G is also minus two, so this is also superficially finite. But of course, it has a subdivergent. So now let us evaluate step by step all these three integrals and then uh, combine the results. Let us begin with uh, the one loop diagram. So for the one loop diagram, we have to look at the T integration. And uh, so let us forget about the prefactors for a moment. So we have an integral over dt times t to the appropriate power. And what is now the power? We have t to the minus one plus two epsilon. And then we have a function g of t. And that g of t is the product of the remaining factors over there at the top of the blackboard. Actually, this g of t also depends on epsilon and uh, the dependence on epsilon comes, for example, from d tilde to the power d over two. So this depends in an analytic way on the variable epsilon. And we can ignore this dependence for uh, the current calculation where we integrate over t. In t, this function behaves as we required last time for the evaluation of such t integrals, namely it is infinitely many times differentiable in t. It is exponentially damped for large t, and for t going to zero, uh, it um, is infinitely many times differentiable and continuous. So once we have such an integral, we know from the last lecture how to determine it. Um, here we have t to the minus one, and then we just get directly a simple pole in uh, the variable two epsilon, and the result is from the last lecture given by one over two epsilon times the function g at zero, and uh, the epsilon remains, okay? Plus a finite remainder integral. And uh, we had an exact expression how to determine this finite remainder. So uh, one had to subtract from g of t the value g at zero, and then integrate only the difference, which has better convergence properties, and therefore gives a well-defined finite integral. But here we have extracted the single pole in one over epsilon, and the coefficient is g at zero. So let us evaluate g at zero. g at zero, let me write it here g of zero and epsilon is simply the remaining integrand e to the i w h times d tilde h at t equals zero. Now, okay, what happens if I put in t equal to zero in w h, then this is of course simply zero. So that just goes to zero. Therefore, we get here just one. And d tilde h does not depend on t at all, so we just get d tilde h, uh, sorry, and here I forgot the exponent, minus d over two, so d tilde h to the power minus d over two. So that is just the result. And uh, this goes here, and then we have our integral. And we can add back the remaining prefactors. Therefore, our result for this integral is equal, including all the prefactors to minus i square times the loop factor cd, times the remaining integral over beta, times the factor two divided by two epsilon, times d tilde to the power minus two plus epsilon, plus a finite remainder. So this is the exact result. And uh, at least the divergent part we have explicitly. And so now we can extract the divergence minus the divergence of this diagram is given by uh, the divergent part, so the uh, one over epsilon part of this. And the one over epsilon part is given here, but in order to really extract the singularity, we have to set epsilon to zero in the coefficient of the one over two epsilon. So we set epsilon to zero here. That gives us then the loop factor with four explicitly, and here we also get just minus two in the exponent. 
So we get minus times minus i square times the loop factor C4 times 1 over 2 epsilon times the remaining integral over beta times d tilde h to the explicit power minus 2. That is really the result. And now we have an explicit result for our uh, divergence and we can briefly discuss it. So this integral here is still to be evaluated. Uh, we might or might not do it, but whatever it is, it is a dimensionless number. It is just a numerical constant. Uh, it is given by the integral over beta uh, from zero to one over that rational function in beta, which is um, not singular, but uh, uh, it goes between one and two in the integration range. So there is no singularity whatsoever. So this is just a, a rational number here, what comes out. And uh, so as a function of the momentum, it is a momentum independent constant. And uh, as in terms of counter terms, this will generate a counter term Feynman rule, which is to be inserted into the next diagram. And that Feynman rule is a momentum independent constant. So it's like a mass counter term. Just for fun and um, so to draw connections to previous uh, discussions, we can calculate the integral. The integral can be calculated if we replace beta plus one uh, is a new integration variable x. Then uh, we have a very simple integrand. The integration range goes from one to two. So if beta goes from zero to one, x goes from one to two, and the integrand is just one over x square, right? Because we have, this is now x, and we have one over this square. So of course, then we integrate one over x square between zero and one. The integrand, uh, the integral is minus one over x. In these limits, you get one minus one over two. So the integral is one half. That's just the result. So therefore, we can also say our, um, actually, let me just write it here in, inside the box. So this expression here, this momentum independent constant, defines now our C H A. And uh, just to remind you, I, uh, in general, we have one counter term Feynman rule associated with this entire Feynman diagram. And the superscript H means that we are working in one specific sector. In general, there are two sectors for this diagram uh, where alpha one is bigger or smaller than alpha two. And we look at one of them and therefore, we uh, give this label here, superscript A. So that is the result of the first diagram. So now, since this is a momentum independent constant, we can now calculate the next diagram. And in this next diagram, uh, this appears just as a factor. So this in quotation marks times CHA is just a multiplication of the integral with a value of this momentum independent constant. And it would be more complicated if that would depend on the momentum because actually in that integral over there, we cannot integrate over momenta anymore. So we have to think first because we go on calculating. But here we don't have to do anything extra and we can directly um, uh, take the result of this counter term diagram as what we have over there times the value of the CHA that was just written on the previous blackboard. There is no extra calculation to be done. Now we can look at the two loop diagram. And we only do 
the dt integral. So in this last Feynman diagram, we evaluate the integral over the variable t, and then we should be able to compare the result to the result of the counterterm diagram, because in the counterterm diagram, combining the first two lines, we have an expression with all the integrals except for the integral over t. And so that could be comparable. So let us do this integration. So then our dt integral looks like this. So, sorry, the t integral has this exponent here. We get again t to the power minus 1 plus 2 epsilon, just like before. And then we have an integrand which depends on t, g of t. Let's ignore the epsilon dependence because we don't need to deal with it at all. So g of t would be now uh, this product here of the two remaining factors. So it's exactly the same structure as before, and the result of this integral gives 1 over 2 epsilon times g of 0 plus a finite remaining integral. Finite means that the remaining integral has no 1 over epsilon pole anymore, and we know it's um, analytical expression. It comes from an integral over the difference g of t minus g of 0. So what is then this value here of g of 0 in this case? So g of 0 is uh, the product of those two expressions, e to the i w g times d tilde g to the power minus d over 2, evaluated at t equals 0. So we can look at the upper blackboard. So what happens if we put in w g, we put t to 0. If we put t to 0 here, then in the numerator, we get only the first two factors. And in the denominator, we also get only the first two factors. And if that is gone away, then it simplifies even further because the 1 plus beta can be cancelled as well. And then what remains is just beta 3 plus 4 and 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. And that is actually identical to this one here. So these two functions are totally equal if t is, uh, t is 0. So we get, instead of this wg, we get w g over h for the reduced Feynman diagram. That is a dramatic simplification. And our dg, dg is given over here, so it's directly written as a product of the other two g's for the subgraph and the reduced graph plus order t. So if t is 0, then we just get a product. d tilde h times d tilde g over h to the overall power minus d over 2. So that is a very nice simplification. So let me highlight this simplification here with a color. Wg for t equals 0 is equal to Wg over h, and dg for t equals 0 is the product dg over h times dh. Let's call it star. So then we can plug uh, back this uh, result into our expression for the two-loop integral. Then the t integral is evaluated, and uh, the remaining integral just has the same integrand where this structure is replaced by this one here times the prefactor 1 over 2 epsilon. So we can immediately combine this with the result for the counterterm Feynman diagram. Let me do it. At least let me begin here. So what is the sum of these two Feynman diagrams now in this way of writing it? We get minus i 
to the fifth power from uh, both kinds because minus i to the fifth appears explicitly in the two loop diagram and uh, the insertion of the counter term into the one loop counter term diagram also gives minus i to the fifth. Then in both cases we have two square. Then we have one factor of CD always and uh, then we have a second factor of either CD or C4 and we have a remaining integral over TG beta 3 plus 4 and or 3 and 4 and beta and the integrand is the following. So first from the two loop diagram we get TG to the power 1 plus 4 epsilon so omega g is minus 1 so we uh, minus 2 so we get plus 1 here that is meaning that this tg integral is actually finite times a remaining integral over t of our finite remainder which depends on t and all the betas and also on epsilon so this is the finite remainder of the t integral. This contains no 1 over epsilon pole. And so we do not need to discuss this much further, but of course it exists. Then plus, now we can from our loop result we can factor out e to the i w g over h and we can also factor out the uh, tilde g over h to the power minus 2 plus epsilon and we can factor out d tilde h to the power minus 2 and we can factor out t g to the power 1 plus 2 epsilon. So if we factor out these two fact, uh, these factors, then what is the remaining factor for the two-loop diagram? So for the two-loop diagram, we have d tilde h to the power minus 2 plus epsilon. So what remains is d tilde h to the power epsilon. Then... Um, In our two-loop integral, we have here Tg to the power 1 plus 4 epsilon. Here we have factored out Tg to the power 1 plus 2 epsilon. So we need a remaining Tg to the power 2 epsilon. And then uh, the loop factor, we factored out Cd but our two-loop integral contains cd squared, so we need another factor of cd. So these are the factors that we get from our two-loop diagram and all divided by 2 epsilon. So then this expression here, this times the prefactor, is exactly the divergent part of our two-loop diagram. Then our counterterm diagram, our counterterm diagram has this integral times the insertion the integral contains exactly the same factors, this wg over h, this g, t tilde g over h to that exponent. And then it contains the insertion. The insertion contains exactly d tilde h to the power minus 2 with no epsilon. The counterterm diagram contains exactly tg to this power, if you look at the top over there. Therefore, from the counterterm diagram, we only obtain the remaining loop factor C4 and nothing else. That is the exact structure of the integral from the sum of these two Feynman diagrams. So the curly bracket ends here. So the integrand uh, has two terms overall, one completely finite term from the two-loop calculation and uh, a second term and the second term has factored out all these common factors between two-loop and counter-term diagram and then the remaining uh, bracket contains this object from the two-loop diagram and that object from the one-loop counter-term diagram. 
and the 1 over 2 epsilon is the same. This is now the result. We put it into a box. Okay, I just want to point out a few lessons that we can memorize from this calculation. And uh, the first lesson is the orange box. We need some important relations between our two-loop graph expressed in terms of this wg and the tilde of g. If we take t equals zero, then this simplifies to combinations of wg over h and d tilde g over h and d tilde of h. And uh, these relationships make it, of course, possible to factor out common factors in the combination of two-loop uh, two plus counterterm diagram and uh, generate a cancellation. The second important lesson is the appearance of interesting functions namely this kind of functions over there. So this C4 and CD, they differ by terms of the order something to the power epsilon. So the general structure of this function is we have one over two epsilon, and in the numerator we have, let's say, some constant A to the power epsilon times a variable TG to the power two epsilon minus one. And this structure of course, for epsilon going to zero, this is finite. Um, let's write it down. This is finite for epsilon going to zero. And if we combine it with the remaining integral here, then the integral overall is finite in the limit epsilon going to zero. So this implements the cancellation. the subdivergence. So if we now really look at the integral, then let us discuss its convergence behavior. So starting with the second line, the second line contains this curly bracket with exactly such a function of this kind. So the function in the limit epsilon going to zero is completely finite. It is actually an analytic function of epsilon including epsilon equals zero, completely analytic. And uh, the prefactor is also analytic in epsilon, so this, for example, uh, is one plus beta to the power something plus epsilon, so this is analytic in epsilon. And here now, we have a function t to the power one plus two epsilon, this is also analytic in epsilon, and if we integrate over t, then this goes like t to the power one. So at t going to zero, this is completely regular and integrable. And at t equal to zero, even if we put epsilon to zero, if we put epsilon to zero exactly, then we get from here logarithm of t. So logarithm of t still diverges for small t, but it diverges only logarithmically. Therefore, combining logarithm of t with t to the power one gives a completely finite integral. Therefore, the second line defines a finite expression, finite in the limit epsilon going to zero, and actually an analytic function in epsilon with a finite limit epsilon going to zero. So the subdivergence has canceled, and in this particular case, the overall integral then gives a finite result. Uh, this is not always the case, but it's finite here because the superficial degree of divergence is finite. And then the top line, the top line is we have here a finite integrand which has no uh, divergence in the limit epsilon going to zero. And uh, again, the remaining integral over Tg is also completely finite because of Tg to the power one. So overall, in this combination, the subdivergence has canceled and the overall expression is entirely finite. And on the technical level, we have seen 
these two ingredients of the calculation, namely such simplifications of our semantic uh, expressions and the appearance of such functions which implement the cancellation. So the cancellation is a little bit indirect. We don't get zero from a cancellation, but such um, functions we have to deal with. And that is the four-dimensional case where the calculation is particularly easy and simple. And now we will go to the six-dimensional case where the same structure will happen, but the calculation is more involved. And the main difficulty and the main extra ingredient is the fact that in six dimensions, the degree of divergence of this is two instead of zero. And that means the divergence is not a momentum independent constant, but it depends on momentum square, depends on this external momentum Q square. And once we insert it into this diagram, we need to take into account this Q square dependence of the insertion. And that means that the counter term is not just a factor in the T integral, it would be a factor in the momentum integral, but in the T integral, uh, the momentum has been integrated over, so something must have happened with the counter term before we are able to plug it into here. And so we need to figure out what that is, how we can actually take into account a momentum dependent counter term in such a T integration. So that is one issue, and then the result will be much more involved because of this. And we have to keep track of what happens to those expressions. But in the end, we will find a very similar, actually the same kind of structure in the sum between these two objects and uh, the same cancellation will happen. So we will learn a few additional lessons in the six dimensional calculations, which are important also for the general case.